Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are uh, joining us from across the globe. And uh, welcome to our session of Rejecting Tradition at Business Schools. My name is Dana Adams. I am a University Partnerships Manager here at Unibuddy, and I'm absolutely thrilled to be joined today by uh, Victor Hedenberg, who is the Business Development Manager of BGA and AMBA, and Dr. Layla Treke, who is the um, Dean of the Mediterranean School of Business, Tunisia. So in just a second, I'm going to turn it over to them, but I do want to note that uh, we will have the chat open for um, the entire session. So um, we are being joined today by uh, participants from Nigeria, Croatia, Canada, um, Tennessee, just south of me. So um, not only is there a, a vast amount of experience and knowledge on the panel, but also um, a lot of insights to be gained across the globe. So please um, participate. We're going to uh, put a little a little time aside at the end for Q&A, um, but I'm going to now let um, Dr. Treke and Mr. Hedenberg introduce themselves a little further and um, uh, start their presentation. And I'll be back to see you in a bit. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Dana. Uh, pleasure to be here with all of you today. My name, as mentioned, was, is Victor Hedenberg with Ambon BJ. I have a uh, presentation to run here, so I'm just going to share my screen a second. Uh, so just give me a minute here. There we go. <clears throat> so can, can everyone see this? Just want to check. Hello? Yes, we can. Okay, great, fantastic. Okay, amazing. So uh, yes, uh, as mentioned, uh, my name is Victor Hedenberg. I am the business development manager for AMBA and BGA. Uh, we are an accreditation agency, a uh, membership agency for business schools worldwide. So um, we're based in London, UK, and uh, we work with schools all across the world. Uh, from Europe, China, uh, Latin America, uh, you know, Middle East, uh, a little bit of presence in North America as well, of course. Um, so today I wanted to really talk a little bit about the whole aspect of differentiation. Um, we have seen some really interesting trends uh, working with more than 400 business schools across the world, what's happening. So I wanted to share a little bit of what we're seeing um, and some ideas perhaps that your school could work on. Uh, and then my colleague Leila will talk a little bit about how her experience mentoring schools uh, and going through the, the various assessment processes that we offer business schools across the world um, have helped basically, how, how she's basically helped them differentiate over time. So um, before I do that in, in detail, um, I'll just go over a little bit about the history of the business school because it's interesting if you look back in the early 1800s, um, the, the business school wasn't really a, um, a primary choice. Uh, it was kind of like a, you know, a secondary thing that you could study to learn a little bit about the, the accounting and finances courses and so forth. Uh, but it really developed into something special when uh, the U.S. universities really started, you know, uh, making it a, a big thing. So if you look at Harvard Business School in the early uh, in, in 19, I think it was 1908 or so forth, the MBA was launched. And that's where we really see the, the business school really propel into the forefront of um, regular education, of university education and being a popular choice. <clears throat> and so the, the standard business school, if you look across the board was the, the education was practically, not I wouldn't say the same, but they offered the same mix of courses. I mean, you, you have your accounting, your finance, maybe a little bit of marketing management, um, but this was basically fit for the, the the times, the industrial age, the industrial revolution that was still going on um, and uh, all the innovations that came up in the early 1900s as well. Now, with the advent of the computer, of course, we started seeing a little bit of differentiation in the programs. Uh, some business schools started experimenting with, uh, you know, specializing their MBA towards various uh, computer specializations. Um, and you started seeing some electives coming in to play as well. And now more recently, we're seeing differentiation in terms of industries. So what we're looking at really is seeing business schools um, 
align themselves against certain industries. So we have business schools in our uh, network. Uh, what they do uh, basically is they align towards you know the healthcare industry. Some are focused on uh, working with charities. Uh, so there's some really interesting things that have happened just recently uh, where business schools are really trying to focus or hone into uh, specific areas. And of course, this works really well if you're a business school part of a big university. So if you have a university that has a strong pharmaceutical school, for instance, uh, really leveraging that part has been working well for, for those business schools. <clears throat> So um, there's this interesting dichotomy now that we're seeing uh, because traditionally, especially if you look at the MBA degree, but many management programs run at business schools, they focus really a lot on general management, um, while industry specialization is becoming really important. And I'll give you an example. I was at Saab uh, in UK, and uh, for, for you who don't know, Saab uh, you might know them from having uh, produced cars in the past, uh, but they do a lot more than that. Uh, cars was like a side business. What they really focus on is the aerospace uh, defense industry. So um, it was really interesting because we had a breakfast talk there and they were talking about how their need for people with general management skills, you know, with sales, management, uh, you know, finance and so forth was really important. But at the same time, the industry specialization was equally important. And one of the things they mentioned was how it would be really nice uh, in like, like a, you know, almost a fancy world where, you know, you could have the general management skills and the industry specialization at one go. So when they hire people, they already know quite a bit because it's quite expensive for companies to train up people who graduate, you know, from a, from a university with a master's and then they have to go into very, the, the very technical details. Uh, and of course that's, Part of, of that's part to be expected, of course. Uh, but the more industry specialization someone has, the easier it is, uh, and the cheaper it becomes for the company to get them, you know, started um, when they when they begin a position within a company. So um, we've seen one of the the differentiations that I'm coming to is really helping business schools to work towards a certain specialization in a certain industry. Um, this might not be uh, every business school's choice, of course, but some business schools are in a good position to do this. As I mentioned, especially the ones that sit within the wider university frame uh, where a university might have a specialization in a certain area. So um, if you look at the network we work with, we have a lot of schools that do this. Um, for instance, TS, uh, which uh, we work with in accredits, they have um, a strong focus on, on responsible management. And a lot of their graduates work at charities. So they have strong connections with charities. And you know that by going to this particular school, you can expect a certain type of, of uh, industry that you're going to go into or a certain type, certain type of company. Uh, same with the Aberdeen Business School, where you have a strong connection to the oil and gas industry or Nanjing University of Aeronautics and Astronautics. They've really utilized their management and business programs to focus on the aerospace industry. So basically what I'm saying is that if your school is in a position to leverage this, really do so because more and more companies, at least from what I'm seeing as well, uh, are asking for the industry specialization, but also the general management. And I think that that balance is an important thing to have in place. Now, of course, there's another uh, few interesting ways a business school can uh, differentiate themselves in. And um, <clears throat> I've been to a number of events uh, recently where we discussed uh, some interesting topics, including subscription services. Now, I'm sure everyone is familiar with Netflix and Amazon, where you pay a monthly fee. And for that monthly fee, you'll get, you know, your TV programs or you'll get, you know, your deliveries from Amazon, uh, Netflix, you'll get your movies. Um, so the idea at this Indian webinar that I went to just recently was that why can't business schools offer some sort of a lifelong learning subscription service? Uh, and if you look at, look at this space, it's a really underutilized one by business schools. Um, you have a massive, massive industry of, or, or um, the potential of, of reaching out to adult learners who are actually going to edX or Coursera or you know other types of online learning platforms. When literally right down the street is a business school that could potentially give them the knowledge they need. And business schools and, and universities in general are great powerhouses 
uh, where there's a, a collection of learning and, and research and it would be a shame to not utilize that. Um, so the idea was to offer some sort of a lifelong learning service where you know you pay a monthly fee or a yearly fee, you can come back for a certain amount of courses at, at the business school. Um, and this type of differentiation is, is really great because it puts the school in a position of, of not only strength for lifelong learners, but it's a great revenue stream for the school as well. You don't really have to just rely on undergraduates and, and postgraduates coming in for you know, three and four year degrees. And also if we see kind of in the future how the markets are developing, I mean, there is an argument to say, uh, make that you know, being very flexible in the future is going to be important. Um, it might be so that a three, four year degree might not even be necessary. Perhaps you can just you know, pay for stackable certificates over time. Uh, and you, know, you take uh, a certain amount of courses one year, then you work at the same time, and you build up your stackable certificates until you have you know, a degree, let's say, after five, six, seven, eight years. It doesn't have to be a, a specific time frame. But what I'm basically saying is to really think a little bit outside of the box as well, where you, know, you can do subscription services on the one hand, but you can also offer more stackable certificates. We're seeing some schools offering this. Uh, if you look at like London Business School, uh, they have that for their executives. Uh, and you can take a number of, of, let's say, courses and put them together to form the diploma, as they call it, a management diploma. Um, but if you look at the undergraduate level, level, it's very underutilized. And some business schools and universities may say that, well, look, you know, many students will not consider this. But I think there, there's this... Uh, you can be, you can react to the industry of what what you know students want, but you can also be the ones that push the industry forward. Um, and and pushing the industry forward is really offering more choice, more flexibility, and more flexibility and and mobility allows, of course, people to learn at their own pace and pick things and, and courses that are relevant to their actual work right now. So something to think about, but we're seeing a lot of discussion on this, uh, particularly in India, where last year, I mean, we had a number of webinars on this uh, particular subject, and it was very much focused on the subscription service. Um, <clears throat> our own chairman, actually, in fact, Bodo um, he mentioned uh, subscription services for business schools in the Financial Times. So um, if, if uh, you're interested, you can probably, I'll see if I can find the article. Maybe we can send that in, a, in an email afterwards to you guys. Uh, but it's a very interesting one where business schools uh, can even think about subscription services for holding a degree. Maybe a controversial um, thing to think about, but at least we're thinking about it. You know? uh, it's about trying to see you know, what else can business schools do uh, that, are, that is relevant and, and can really match the needs of today's uh, today's industries and, and workplaces. Um, so, <clears throat> going if you if you look, the reason why this whole differentiation question is so important, there was a Financial Times article back in 2018, I believe, uh, that showed that three business schools were closing down a week in the U.S. and that just showcases the extreme saturation that exists in the market, particularly in the US. And if you, especially look at the programs that are being offered from, a, let's say a, a regular liberal arts school, they're practically the same. Um, and they don't offer a lot of experiential learning and they don't do anything that differentiates them in, self, in terms of, you know, industry focus or, you know, it's definitely nothing in, in subscription services, anything like that. So the, this, this topic is very, very important for schools to think about. <clears throat> And what we've been doing ourselves, uh, very quickly, uh, B uh, BJ, the Business Graduates Association, which is part of AMBA, um, we launched, in fact, our accreditation to focus specifically on how we can help schools differentiate through impact metrics. So rather than being kind of like having that prescriptive approach where we say, okay, as a business school, we want you to you know, fulfill exactly these type of criteria, we look at, okay, what are your objectives as an institution? What are you trying to achieve? Uh, over the next five, 10 years. And then we work in a very consultative manner to measure the, the impact of how you meet those objectives. And then we consult the school, of course, and help them in terms of enhancing those feedback loops and providing suggestions and advice, which uh, mentors play a big role in. And Leila will fill you in more on that uh, as well later. So that mentorship process is very much important. And uh, we have found that schools 
really benefit out of this process. Uh, they don't feel basically um, uh, constrained to be working in a certain way. Uh, rather, they are allowed to work on various ideas, fulfill various objectives that they feel passionate about, uh, whether that is, you know, uh, meeting some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, whether they want to be a, a school that's very practical oriental, oriented and trains entrepreneurs, maybe they want to be research oriented, but whatever it is, the school is able to pick areas that they can really differentiate in and, and not be punished for it, but actually rewarded instead. And the way we do that, of course, is through our continuous impact model, or SIM, as we say, uh, and this measures schools in a number of various areas, but say a school that's very research focused uh, will have more impact metrics in the areas of scholarship than a school that perhaps is more, let's say, trying to have uh, more successful entrepreneurs. They might be looking at graduate achievements instead or value creation. So what I'm saying at the end of the day is that, is that what we're trying to do to help the industry along this way is to offer an accreditation that looks at the outcome and impact of the school. And we work on trying to help the schools in the differentiation. We don't want to punish schools for thinking outside of the box, um, quite the contrary. So that's how we use the continuous impact model. And I won't go into any of the details here. Uh, you can always go to our website to check uh, any of the accreditation documents in if you're interested. So it's just to head to businessgraduatesassociation.com uh, and, and head to what we do with accredited schools. We have a couple of case studies as well on, on how we've supported schools in these areas. So it could be of interest to, to read. But that's uh, it from my end. Those were some ideas on differentiation and what we are seeing in terms of trends um, and if you want to learn more about the, the BJ accreditation, you can, of course, head to our website. But now, uh, even more interestingly, you'll hear from one of our assessors and mentors from the network, Layla, uh, who has a lot of experience in this area. So over to you, Layla. Thank you very much, Victor, and uh, very happy to, part of, to be part of this discussion. Uh, so myself, uh, as introduced, I'm Dean of the Mediterranean School of Business, which is based in Tunis, Tunisia. And I have also been involved with EMBA BGA for the past uh, 10 years almost, so celebrating my 10 years next year in 2022. And for schools that are in Europe, Middle East and Africa within the EMEA region. And uh, it is really a part that I enjoy a lot from my current position because it's a sharing experience. So it's peer to peer, it's very collegial. Uh, it's, a, it's a way for schools to reflect, to step back and to hear from peers on what could they do better? What are they doing really well and where they could improve? And uh, during the session where we are more focusing on distinctiveness, I wanted maybe to share with you a little bit on uh, which schools I thought did really well and why they did it really well. And hopefully those will be some takeaways for those who are attending the sessions with us. So among the things that I really saw is uh, usually business schools forget that a business school is a business in a way where we teach very well uh, strategy courses, but not a lot of school actually go through the process of the strategic planning, having it very collaborative, it's, uh, and really living the exercise personally, writing clearly what are your strengths, your weaknesses, the opportunities, the threats that you should and could be facing, and having it very inclusive. For instance, uh, some of the, like really having a representation of all stakeholders within the strategic uh, reflection, uh, from students to faculty, of course, administration, but also parents, alumni, and corporates. And so really a way also to engage with the community and keep them committed to what the school is trying to do. And uh, as Victor said a little bit in the way where uh, we sometimes forget our purpose. Where do, what do we see ourselves doing, bringing to the society? What is our value added? Do we see ourselves more as a teaching institution? Which is fine. I mean, it's uh, as long as you do it very well. But if you say that you are a teaching institution, you really need to show that your focus and whatever you do is focused on teaching. So if you have intellectual contribution, it's going to be on case studies that you would use within the classroom, etc. But if you are a research institution, if you say you're a research institution, then are you more in applied research, theoretical research, research that is beneficial for the corporate world? For instance, in uh, 
countries like Tunisia or emerging countries in general, applied research would be more beneficial for business schools than, uh, than theoretical research, because at least for applied research, you would be adding value to your community and not competing with the other schools globally, uh, with whom it would be very difficult to compete. And uh, the other thing is to know who is really your target market. Are you more uh, like local, regional, international? So those are questions that are really key to be able to see the best distinctive position for a business school, because distinctiveness is not so much of uh, just uh, you know, saying I'm going to be innovative, but that being innovative, you know, useful for the region, for the country where you are, will you be able to clearly bring this innovation and how do you do it? So the other step is really how are you doing it? So uh, well, when we say how are you doing it, how is it shown within your curriculum, for instance, if a school says uh, I'm into uh, developing entrepreneurial mindset, how is your curriculum clearly developing these types of skills, this type of mindset for all the programs for which your students are enrolled in? And also, how is whatever inte intellectual contribution the school is developing, how is it also benefiting uh, the classrooms and the read, you know, and your ecosystem in terms of entrepreneurship? Are you developing case studies around entrepreneurship? Are you helping the, the community uh, of research around entrepreneurship, etc.? And also the events and whatever community outreach you will be developing, you know, how are those benefiting the entrepreneurial community? And what you really see is that once you find your distinctiveness and once you really make sure that you're applying it consistently in everything the school does, it really helps you build more synergies and uh, uh, across whatever the school is doing and also having a, you know, a, a compelling uh, proposition for either the corporates or the international partners that you're seeking, or even the students that you're targeting. You have a clear positioning. If you want to be an entrepreneur, come to our school. You have a clear positioning of uh, uh, maybe, uh, you know, where business meets engineer, which is a little bit our case, because we are within a university setting. And so if you're really in between business and engineering, this would be the right university for you. But then you need to do it well, as we said. And doing it well is really making sure that whatever the school does is linking, bridging, for instance, for us, business and engineering, and uh, whatever the distinctive position you chose, you really need to make sure that you create synergies and all the activity a business school is usually doing. Uh, so, um, like I said, it's uh, this, uh, you know, strategic uh, exercise, the strategic positioning exercise of course, should be done every five years or, uh, you know, in an evolving, rapidly evolving world. It's really also a way to make sure that there are not new entrants and is your distinctiveness still a distinctiveness five years later. Uh, and it's uh, really a time to reflect, to reflect, step back. And that's highly valuable for, uh, for the, you know, uh, the... Uh, for making sure that you are sustainable and always bringing value to your ecosystem. So those are a little bit the ideas I wanted to share. Uh, and I'll hand it back to you, Victor. Yeah, I think I think it's uh, from both our end. So uh, I, I think this can be really nice for an open discussion on, on uh, you know, what the audience thinks and uh, perhaps we can have some questions then. So over, over to you, Dana. Thank you so much. Um, thank you both. I love uh, um, I love the ideas of differentiation. Um, I love the ideas of really let's get down and figure out what who we are. Um, nice to have that focus when you're uh, from like my perspective where I work with um, admissions professionals. Um, being able to say this is our value is just uh, beyond value, truly. Um, so we do have some questions. Uh, Victor, this is really for you. This uh, you spoke to the subscription model. Yeah. Uh, can subscription fo focused education really take off? Um, how do you see business schools implementing this? I think um, there, there are two ways to see, I guess, the subscription service. I kind of touched on it a little bit, and that is 
one could be for lifelong learners and one could be just, you know, for people who want to get a degree or something like that. So I think it probably mostly applies best for lifelong learners at the moment, only because if you're working in any, any industry today and, and, you know, one point or another, you might become a manager, um, understanding things within finance, marketing, uh, negotiation, soft skills are very important. Uh, and being sympath sympathetic and empathetic as well. I mean, these type of these are type of things that you know if you haven't if you haven't been taught this or you aren't that naturally, uh, it's going to really hurt you. And so, business schools have I think the opportunity to to teach these things on an ongoing basis. Um, and a lot of business schools have like alumni services, but I think they're very underutilized. Actually, the alumni services almost becomes like a a cash cow generated like yeah you, you went here for four years and you know uh, we're going to keep hunting you down you know every year uh, to make you donate and i think that's really the wrong way that's not really value creation at, at all business schools should think about being a value creator and the way to do that is to say okay well if you want money from your alumni what can you offer them uh, you know on an ongoing basis and there's such a big hole to fill I mean, I'm looking at business schools every day and so many are not offering anything to their, to their alumni or very limited. And you have, you know, these online providers like edX and Coursera, like, you know, if business schools really wanted to, they could wipe that out in a second. Uh, and I think business schools haven't really leveraged that to the same degree as perhaps they could. So in the subscription-based model, lifelong learning could work really well. And then it's up to the school to decide whether they want to do like a, a monthly subscription. You can do like one course a month or uh, like a, maybe you want to do a six month subscription or a year, but you know, that's where a school can differentiate and, and decide on some of those things. Thank you. Um, you, you spoke to the three uh, schools a week closing that uh, statistic from back in, I think you said 2018. I remember reading that. Um, you know, it sticks with us. Uh, we talk to business schools every day and um, it is about differentiation, level of engagement, um, value for the dollar. Am I, am I getting valued? You know, is this going to be a great choice for me? So um, I'm very familiar with that in the United States, but are there different trends by um, countries or continents that you all perspective? And if so, what are they? I mean, I think at least uh, I'm sure Lily can comment on this as well. I think uh, what we have seen is that it, it it's more so in the U.S. from what I've noticed, but that doesn't mean it's only been in the U.S. I mean, we've seen a lot of schools across Europe being forced to be different or innovate. Uh, we've seen that in Latin America. Uh, especially in China as well. But China is a bit different because many of the schools are publicly owned, state owned. Um, <clears throat> but I would say mostly in the US and mostly among what we would call the liberal arts colleges or the polytechnic universities that run a very, you know, similar type of program. You, you get pretty much the same going there three, four years. It wouldn't really be different if you went to another school, except for perhaps different names of the faculty members. I mean, it sounds a bit harsh, but at the end of the day, that's that's been where they've been lagging a little bit and, and they haven't really done much in experiential learning and so forth. And um, it's been very traditional academic learning where business kind of demands a little bit more experiential learning. But what about you, Leila? What, what have you noticed from your end? So uh, I think it also depends on uh, the awareness of uh, the market where you are. In the sense, like for instance, for us uh, in Tunisia, uh, it's more of a francophone oriented type of education. And, uh, and uh, for us, like uh, the first distinctive element we had and we brought was more the North American Anglo-Saxon style of education. Uh, but then what does this mean, right? In the sense where, uh, is it uh, because, of course, the vibrant student life is among the things that the big highlight of North American education, but for us, it was also highlighting to the market. It's not only that, it's experiential learning, it's applied research, it's uh, strong corporate links, which uh, sometimes might be lacking in more uh, traditional, uh, you know, uh, universities. So uh, we found ourselves in a situation where when you innovate, you also need 
to build also awareness on why this is different. And uh, so, uh, so you find yourself innovating, but you still need to convince the market that what you're doing is, uh, is worth coming or is worth, uh, you know, uh, uh, contributing to. So, um, so I think that's the, uh, like uh, the challenges in more developing slash emerging countries uh, is uh, even when you bring innovation, the market might not be mature to understand this innovation. And so you also need to do a lot of communication on this innovation. Rather in more mature markets like in the US or uh, Europe, uh, then you know the target population is very well informed and aware and will look to uh, clear distinctiveness. And for us, you need to show why your distinctiveness is important. Thank you. Do you all, um, kind of expanding on that, you mentioned uh, corporate, do you feel that corporate partnership or collaboration um, can be a part of this uh, when you're looking at innovating in this way? Yeah, I think uh, that's a, a big part of um, where, you know, the future skills will come from in the sense where uh, uh, a lot of companies that we, like business schools would work with will bring specific needs that maybe the business schools wouldn't have thought of in terms of technical skills or specific skills that they would need. So this uh, strong collaboration not only could be done within the research arena, but also in terms of skills development that are specific to the needs of an industry uh, that could be you known those new jobs and those new trends. And so this collaboration between university and corporates could also bring innovation in what type of uh, skills you want your students to have. Thank you. Um, so if a school does not have um, a specific industry, something that they are already known for, that they can lean on for that differentiation piece, um, what do you all suggest that they do? How can they stand out? Well, there, there have been some really interesting things that are happening in our network of schools. I mean, as I mentioned, we, we work with more than 400 schools. So you, you get to see how some schools try to differentiate themselves. If it's not a certain industry, what they try to do is connect themselves to, like maybe, as we mentioned earlier, having a really strong connection to employers uh, around the world, making that a differentiating factor. And they work very hard. I mean, they dedicate, they create dedicated teams specifically for the employer relations. Uh, that are quite big and, and they realize the importance of that aspect. Other schools, what they're doing is they're offering, they're going kind of into more of the stackable certificate area. So they're offering like short diplomas and so forth where, you know, someone might be, not be able to afford or have the time to do a full master's degree, for instance. Uh, but now they can do diploma programs instead. And that's, you know, a great differentiating factor. Um, it, you know, uh, one that was speaking to a South African school just the other day, their focus is working specifically uh, with corporates. Uh, so what they do basically is they say, uh, look, you have all these people working at your company. We will make a tailor-made education for you. Um, and, you know, you come here for X amount of time uh, and we will train you against, you know, what you need. I know, for instance, Holt International Business School does that too. They also have uh, what used to be like the Ashridge executive education that's kind of been merged of course and now they offer that as a option for schools to uh, or sorry corporates to have this tailor-made education for them with their specific challenges and needs and opportunities so there are a lot of interesting ways schools are trying to differentiate themselves but those are some of the ways that some of the things that i've seen at least and i really think that it's, it would be very difficult especially, uh, you know, today in our uh, setting, uh, very difficult to be sustainable if you don't uh, look into your distinctiveness. It's a highly competitive market. If you're just giving general uh, education, I don't think these schools would be able to continue to survive in a way. It's, uh... you did, and I love that you utilized your SWOT analysis. It threw me right back into um, my master's business program. <laughs> But it's it always too. works. There are many others nowadays. That's why lifelong learning is uh, great too. There, but SWAT still works very well. SWAT always works. <laughs> um, so, 
you mentioned China that most of the business schools are nationalized there. Um, so it is, it might be easier for private schools to take these kind of steps. Um, when you're part of a public university or a national um, accreditation system, what, um, you know, it's a lot more difficult. What would your suggestions be for uh, schools that are in that position that maybe don't have that bit of uh, leeway? I mean, the, what we've seen at least with the kind of like the state owned universities is, or business schools that are part of a bigger university is that they usually have some other very strong departments. Uh, it could be in biology, could be in aeronautics, engineering. Uh, I mean, some really interesting ones where, okay, maybe you can't differentiate yourself in some ways because there are some really strong regulations to that. But what if you could partner with some of the other, other departments and offer something that is a bit different to your you know, normal business management education? Um, and we have seen schools where there's like no communication between the two. Like the business school is operating in a vacuum and you have the engineering school that does complete its own. And it's going, oh, you're engineering. I mean, they have some great things going on here. Why are you not, you know, offering some sort of a, you know, uh, joint type of education here? So if a school, if a university that's state owned or has, you know, a lot of uh, uh, bureaucracy to go for, uh, that could be a potential way to differentiate. I, I um live about eight blocks from a, a research facility here and they um, have an equine administration program in their business school. And that is, um, it's a small program, but they really leverage it out because it's so innovative and different that people remember it. You know, they think about it. They may end up going for an MBA, but they feel like there's that option that obviously they're thinking very forward and marketing it well. So it's nice to be able to see that. Um, so I'm going to ask a question um, that we've managed to not talk about yet. Uh, how has COVID impacted um, innovation, differentiation? Um, we made it through 40 minutes without talking about COVID. So now we'll chat about it for a couple of minutes. So at least uh, maybe I could share some of uh, the insights either from my school or the latest visit that have been online, the latest panel visits that have been online. Uh, but I think, yeah, some schools really manage to take advantage of being online to bring more internationalization within their curriculum because, uh, you know, sometimes in some specific countries, it might be difficult. Uh, among the important thing is to give an international learning experience to your students, right? Because uh, uh, you want them to be able, once they're in the corporate world, to uh, to either open, you know, contribute to internationalizing more the business where they are in, etc. And among the ways is having international visiting faculty. There's the content of your program, but also the international visiting faculty that come to teach and bring this diversity in the learning of the students. And a lot of schools uh, took advantage of being online to be able to, uh, with less fees, bring in these international faculty virtually to teach within their programs. Uh, also, uh, some schools really managed to bring innovation with those digital tools, you know, so uh, like Kahoot or, or other tools uh, that you wouldn't have thought of before. Uh, but then, you know, being online, uh, you want to engage with students and so how to bring those digital, uh, you know, application apps to have it more interactive uh, and that's something that stayed and that really showed to be a lot more beneficial in the learning of those millenniums of this new generation that really needs to be constantly engaged and don't go through traditional learning models uh, anymore. So those are two things uh, that I saw you know, of a good, uh, good throwback of COVID, let's say. Yeah, and uh, I mean, if, if anything, I mean, some schools have used it to differentiate. I think a lot of schools have used it to keep up with the times. And what I mean by that is that a lot of schools may have underinvested in some of the digital tools that could make things easier, uh, you know, for students. And I think what's happened is that 
with the the pandemic, a lot of schools were investing in a lot of the the different uh, digital platforms for you know downloading or keeping you know uh, lectures on or accessing perhaps uh, various uh, resources or anything like that. Um, and they have become a lot better at that now. Uh, I think schools have really realized that wow, okay, this is an area we can't really ignore. It's something that we should really utilize. And the fact that you know not. Perhaps every lecture has to be done in person. Perhaps it could be done online. Some of them could be online. Um, I know some faculty members from what I've heard don't like the blended approach where you have like, um, you know, in class, but then you also have people tuning in from the screen. I've heard that's very difficult. I haven't done it myself, so I can't really speak for it. But from what I've heard, that is a bit difficult. But, you know, what that does, if anything, is that schools are trying new things now. You know, if anything, that's a really good thing, because I think as an institution, especially teaching institutions, we tend to be a little bit more static uh, and a little bit afraid to try new things. It's worked in the past. Why change it? And uh, as you said, Leila, I mean, business schools are businesses at the end of the day, and businesses always have to try new things, always innovate. Otherwise, tomorrow you'll be gone, you know? Um, and I think the pandemic has made some schools at least realize that, you know, trying new things isn't really a bad thing. And if they don't succeed, well, we'll keep trying new things until it does. Uh, you look at companies like Amazon, they, they, they have a hundred different projects and only one may make it, but that's enough for them to make it a, you know, a successful, profitable um, product. So. I've seen I've seen schools are trying th things like they never did before, uh, and and a lot of them are saying actually this wasn't such a bad thing at the end of the day. And also uh, within you know internally within the business schools throughout the different departments, the administrative staff as well, uh, you you also see that it helped you know upgrade upskill. Uh, those digital skills within uh, the internal staff members and uh, and engaging easier on projects, etc. So, um, so that was a benefit of uh, the pandemic as well. I have a question here that um, kind of segues into that. You covered a little bit of it, but um, how about utilizing technologies to enhance the learning experience? Talked a little bit about that, but have you seen any? schools in your experience that um, that really offer an experience that is superior, that are doing it very well, and what are they doing? I, well, Lila, do you wanna go first? Go ahead. Okay, um, well, I mean, we have seen some schools offer, uh, let's say, um, a really good, uh, let's say, uh, um, replacement, not a replacement, but let's say, uh, if you can't do it in person, a really good opportunity to do it virtually, where they've invested in studio quality education. I mentioned Holt before. Um, I saw that what they've done, for instance, invested quite heavily in a, a studio. It looks like a, you know, newsroom, basically. Um, and it's very interactive, like the, the, the faculty member feels like they are in the classroom and they can see everyone on the wall. Uh, I think IE Business School is doing the same, actually, they've been doing it for a few years. Uh, so it's like a wonder wall where you can see all these uh, different participants. And there are different ways to do this, of course, but, but HALT has done their way, IE has done theirs. Um, there's one technology, now I can't remember the name of it but there was one of the South American schools so it's, that was telling me, and they had uh, this piece of software where you, if, if you'd watched a lecture online, you can type a specific keyword and boom, you make it to that specific time, uh, time uh, point uh, where that lecture mentioned it. And uh, some lecturers have been a bit scared about that. It's like, oh my God, now they can pick and you know dissect my entire argument here. Uh, but it's been really good for students because now they can, they can really, instead of, you know, remember where was it in that lecture where we talked about the specific strategy, now they can just type it in and boom, you're in that specific moment or that time frame where they mention it. So uh, those are a couple of things that, that at least I've seen. Maybe, uh, yeah, I could uh, add to that, you know, technology in some schools has also helped in giving more individualized learning in the sense where you do have some softwares where uh, like for instance the professor would use the flipped classroom model 
So uh, in the sense where the course content would be given uh, through a video that is recorded ahead of time and they would use the class time face to face to uh, uh, respond to questions, solve problems together, etc. And this uh, specific software helped uh, when the uh, lecture was recorded, you would the professor would have a dashboard and you would know you know which students did pause to uh, rewind to listen to something. Uh, so it really gives you you know which aspects uh, were really well understood which others were more difficult and also there's a quiz at the end of each lecture that is recorded and so when the professor comes. He really will only insist on uh, those uh, elements that the students didn't understand well and then go to problem solving and whatever is more fun to do and more interactive uh, within the classroom setting. And uh, there's also this uh, an another startup that is working on uh, you know, uh, education and they're using it now more in high schools and starting to implement it at the university level. But this is more using AI in the learning experience of students. And so it's, uh, but then you really need to, professors needs to engage in the sense where uh, it's digitalizing, you know, all your course. So you need your learning outcomes, all the assessments uh, that are within a digital platform. And then the, uh, the student would have kind of a map, what are the learning outcomes that he masters? What are the others that he still needs work? And this tool can even predict, given that he did low on those specific competencies, he will have difficulties moving forward uh, for other courses that build upon those competencies. So that's really, a, that's something that seems to be very exciting and using AI for more individualized uh, learning experiences. I love that. I love the idea of the, um, um, the, the professors knowing what your engagement level is, what your difficulty level is. I could have definitely used that in my statistics classes, probably. <laughs> They'd probably still be sorting through it. Um, so a two-parter here about business school alliances. Uh, so a few years, we started to see alliances um, forming. Are you um, finding that that is helpful in creating unique programming for students? Um, and what are your suggestions for doing that, if so? I mean, we've been talking about business school alliances since um, I think 2018. I think we, we started mentioning it in our Stockholm uh, conference. Um, and, you know, the interesting thing about them is they, they're undoubtedly going to create a very different experience you get anywhere else. I mean, first of all, internationally, you'll get a, an unrivaled experience because it's one thing, uh, very few schools can have campuses you know, many parts of the world and do it well. When you can when you can pair up with schools that have great campuses, great faculty, and so forth, and can create programs tailored uh, alongside that, you can create a really good experience there. And then, what also comes into play, of course, is the type of education. So, you know, if you there are different ways you can do this. Perhaps you want to have three schools that, or four schools in an alliance that focus on different industries, or perhaps they all focus on the same industry, but you know, different parts of it. Uh, but it's it's uh, it's the same type of philosophy that goes behind the economics. If you've read I Pencil, you know, where you know small the small small individual parts, you know, would take very long time to I mean, it would take very long time to produce a pencil, and it's very very expensive but when everyone does the small parts themselves it becomes a great experience and much cheaper uh, for everybody so the kind of same principle can be applied to the business schools and when you have alliances that are really strong there, there are a few that exist already now um, then I think that experience can really be utilized to create uh, something that one school can pull off by themselves whether that's international uh, opportunities whether that is exposure to more industries perhaps degree programs that just don't exist anywhere else that you can get. Um, I know, for instance, if you look at the Trium MBA, that's an interesting one because then you have three schools, really good different schools that have created an MBA that, that uh, they share between themselves. So, um, and, and the, their new more alliances coming. I, I think, you know, the more alliances that exist, the better. It's, it's kind of like the air, uh, you know, the air, uh, 
uh, alliances that exist right now, like One World and so forth. I mean, there's there's some you can really create a strong network that that uh, together you become a, a powerful force in the world of education. So we have one question left. Um, if you're a business school that has strong selling points, um, it really always comes down to how do we how do we market these to students so they know. You know, how do we fill a class with engaged students? Um, so what would you suggest are ways that business schools can market themselves? Yeah, I can start on this one. Uh, so uh, usually what we see works well is more building on your alumni and the success of your alumni. So uh, that's uh, something that uh usually works very well when you would have alumni speak be the best ambassadors in a way and uh, at least those are for your prospective students uh, those are peers they would uh, you know it's uh, they would listen more to those than maybe a professor or uh, or somebody else so that's uh that's one recommendation i would give is uh using more uh your alumni community I think um, the, the marketing aspect from, from our end, what we try to do, at least with BJ accreditation, is really help schools market this, uh, this aspect. So if a school becomes BJ accredited, we give them an impact report that shows exactly the areas uh, that they've developed, that they, you know, their, their strategic objectives have been held within. So for instance, if you're a business school based in uh, Lviv, for instance, or in Paris or whatever it is, and you're focused on uh, training entrepreneurs, then the impact report shows exactly why your school is accredited and what your school did to achieve the accreditation. So what we're trying to do is, is make it a bit more tangible and transparent to prospective students. Uh, that's at least I, I, one marketing tool that we think schools can use in the future, uh, at least to say that, hey, look, you know, we're accredited for this particular reason, and this is how we achieved it through our own objectives. So that it doesn't just become a, a staple or a label. I mean, uh, where you say, "Okay, you're accredited. Great. Why are you accredited? How did you achieve this?" Uh, the accreditation becomes uh, has more meaning now. Wow. Okay, this accredit this school is accredited because they have some great connection to charities, and and they if I want to work within the, some of the leading charities, they have all the connections. They're great. Or oh, this school is one of the best you know, uh, research-led, you know, uh, one of the best research uh, produced business schools that I can really, you know, go and do a DBA, for instance, because they have great resources for that, or, you know, whatever it is. Uh, but the impact report kind of creates that level of transparency. So that's one way, at least from our perspective, uh, that we try to help schools uh, market themselves. Well, thank you. And thank you both. Um, this has been informative, enlightening. Um, I know that all of our participants have loved hearing about all the ways they can innovate, they can differentiate, uh, they can affect some change and um, really learn and know who they are and what their purpose is and then take that out and focus on it. So thank you both so much. Um, I will, uh, I think you said you were going to put maybe a couple of things in an email, a couple of assets. And uh, we'll look forward to those, send them out to our participants. And you all both have a lovely day. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Dan. Thank you so Thank much. You great host. Nice seeing you, Victor. <laughs> nice seeing you, Leila. Thank you, Dana. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye.